So um, welcome back to the afternoon session of our Student to Startup event. Um, this afternoon is going to be led by Francesca Garcia at Digital Catapult. Um, she's going to be doing a talk about the introduction to the MI Garage, and then we will be followed by some innovative presentations. So we've got a number of speakers, uh, Charles Fry, the CTO of the Additive Flow, Anna Jordan, the co-founder and operations leader of Akira Technology, Vishal Kumar, the CEO of Photogram, and Renee Perkins, the founder and CEO of CityMass. Uh, this will then be followed by a panel session at three o'clock, which is about the journey to entrepreneurship plus question and answers. Please can I ask if any of you do have questions that you use the Q&A se uh, section at the bottom of your screen, um, uh, and we can answer these as we go along or towards the end, whatever works best for the panelists. But I'm going to now hand over to Francesca and um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, yeah, let me just share my screen. And uh, yeah, as Sharon said, I will um, do my best to kind of give you an overview of the machine intelligence garage, but then I will leave it to the to the startups and the experts themselves to talk about their, um, their journeys, as that will probably be most useful for everybody in the room. I um, just want to check everyone can see my screen all right. Um, but uh, to kind of kick it off, so I work at Digital Catapult, as um, Sharon mentioned, I'm a senior policy and research manager there. And to kind of, I mean, we could speak about Digital Catapult for hours, but just to kind of contextualize um, what I'll be sharing with you. Um, so we're really looking to accelerate the early adoption of advanced digital technologies. And we do this through supporting startups. And one of the ways that we uh, try to support startups is through the machine intelligence garage, which is specifically for AI um, companies, early stage companies. So as Sharon has already kind of um, outlined, just brief house housekeeping. Uh, for me, I'll get the Q&As at the end. Um, I'm happy for the innovators to dictate themselves what they prefer, but we do have about a 20 minute session at the very end after the panel for discussion. So please do write your uh, questions as they come, um, but we'll, we will have time at the end to, to discuss. Um, so yeah, I we've already kind of I had a brief intro, but um, as I said here, we're going to be uh, we're going to be hearing from these uh, four fabulous companies uh, later today who ha have all been on the MI Garage, so they can tell you themselves a little bit uh, more uh, through first-hand experience uh, what we do. So, what do we want to achieve? Um, we are really when we kind of started uh, this program, uh, we started back in January two thousand and eighteen. We wanted to kind of develop something which would help and support uh, early stage companies in developing new products and services, increase revenue, receiving investment, and also kind of developing AI responsibly. So what we decided was um, that there needs to be kind of three main uh, themes and elements uh, to this program. And I'll kind of talk briefly about each uh, thread. So the first is um, around the kind of technical support. and. Um, I guess the reason why I'm I'm telling everyone in the room this as well, um, who, who might be a master's student or PhD student, um, wherever you are, um, is that I think oftentimes uh, all of the like resources that you can actually receive for free are, are not necessarily understood um, or known about. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of in your tools, in your toolkit of support. Um, we do provide, um, for example, 100, K in um, cloud computing vouchers. Um, you can also get access to high, uh, high performance computing uh, through NVIDIA, for example. We've even facilitated connections um, to um, supercomputers um, across the UK. So we're kind of that facilitation link between other research centers, which again are providing startups for free as well as um, providing our own uh, cloud compute um, vouchers as well. Um, and unlike other programs, because of that funding that we have from government and um, the funding from the European Union and the CAPAI, um, there isn't any fee to join. We don't take equity in the program. It's really to kind of support um, the acceleration and to kind of stimulate the UK economy. Um, so something to, to bear in mind as I kind of um, pitch the program to you. Uh, the other thing that you can do with us as well is uh, data study groups with Alan Turing, uh, which again, a really cool way to kind of uh, talk to other kind of experts in the field as well. So with the uh, business support, we are kind of constantly looking at maybe some of the big 
challenges and barriers that startups have and they request. Um, so things like, you know, how to pitch to investors, um, sales strategy, um, pricing strategy. We've also recently, for example, done um, a masterclass with the information as information commissioner's office so that um, a startup can be more compliant with GDPR and kind of like get legal advice as well. Um, so we do try to kind of keep it really practical and hands on um, because obviously, understandably as a startup, maybe you can't, um, you know, get your own person who will be like a legal expert or a marketing expert, especially at the beginning. Um, so this is again there to help. And something I will mention it more in the context of digital catapult because um, we have this mission to accelerate the adoption of advanced digital technology, whether that be with startups, we also do the same with corporates. And um, some of our work in the past has been to actually match startups to say like large corporate companies um, and, you know, kind of build that sales pipeline for a startup as well. Um, finally, the last kind of strand of support that we offer is um, around ethics. Um, so I think there's a lot Right now, um, everyone's kind of heard about ethical AI, responsible AI, and we're really trying to kind of pioneer how um, startups can maybe think about this in practice. Um, and we have a fabulous ethics committee, which is uh, chaired by Professor Luciano Floridi of the University of Oxford. And um, he, along the committee, have kind of helped us steer the activities and the things that we talk about with startups. And we have these kind of, um, packages, if you will, um, which startups can kind of um, apply for. So for example, a deep dive where you get um, access to two um, AI ethics experts over the course of a year, and they can help you build a product roadmap in line with that. Um, I know that Anna from Alkira here has um, also been a part of that. So um, in any questions about that, I'm sure she'll be happy to take those later on. Um, so yeah, I've spoken a lot about the different sponsors that we have already, um, but this is a kind of snapshot of like, you know, different hardware, software providers, um, research centers, and, um, you know, it is growing all the time, depending on uh, what's happening in the, in the ecosystem. So um, just to kind of finish off before I hand over to my um, wonderful guests, um, just to kind of summarize a bit. Um, so we have had over 100 startups with us already in the past three years. We've had um, 13 cohorts. Um, we've also had themed ones. So some have been like specifically um, applications with it for AI and creative. Some have been like specifically AI and IoT um, to kind of give tailored support. Um, and over the course of these three years, we've helped over um, all of our startups raise over um, 52 million in private investment, as well as helping over 50% to increase their turnover. We also um, we also won two COGX awards earlier this year, which is very nice. Um, so MI Garage won one and Digital Catapult won another for specifically AI ethics. Um, and again, if any of these things are of interest, then uh, please do get in contact with me as well. Um, and so finally, for the people kind of sitting in the room, um, we're really keen on really strong tech team that are kind of building an AI product or service and you are data ready and you want computation desperately and you're kind of keen to consider ethics as well um, and that's kind of our main target audience so if that sounds like something of interest or it does it will in future um, it's open every 12 weeks so we run uh, multiple cohorts a year and you can apply online and you can also get in contact with me if that would uh, be easier if you have any um, additional questions. So I've um, raced through that uh, in the interest to, to save more time for, for our guests. Um, but yeah, thanks very much. And um, I, will, I will hand it over to, to our panelists that we have. Um, I think I'm just right on time there. So I don't know if we want to jump straight into additive flow, hearing from Charles, or if anyone had any kind of like quick question, I think we're all okay in the Q&A box. So um, without further ado, go ahead, Charles, over to you. Thank you very much, Francesca. Can you see my screen uh, one second now? Can you see my screen? I absolutely can, yes. 
Fantastic. Okay, so um, my name is Charles Freed, and today I'm going to be presenting uh, the company I'm working on, which is called Additive Flow, along with a quick introduction about myself. And if we have time, I'm going to jump into a very brief demo of the software itself. So um, yeah, so quick intro, really. Um, I guess I always had a very strong interest in how things were made and specifically automation. Um, as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm very lazy. So I'm always thinking like, how can I automate stuff? Um, that's kind of like the underlying thinking. So I built my first 3 printer at age um, 15. So I guess it's been like a good 15 years I've been in this uh, industry. I started then my first company, which was a 3D printing farm uh, in my university dorm. So I had three or four printers there running full time whilst I was uh, sleeping. Um, and so there we served about 100 companies, including some quite large ones, such as Rolls-Royce. Then I did some um, research at University College London, um, looking at advanced materials and algorithmic engineering. And that is where I kind of really gained a deep uh, insight into uh, the software that underlies the design uh, for 3D printing, so CAD. Um, then I worked for uh, both startups and large corporates, developed some machine learning models for Airbnb. And currently I'm working on Additive Flow, um, which is a multi-physics optimization software and also Unsun Research, which is a quantitative trading fund. So quick intro uh, about the team here. It was founded by Alexander and um, myself. And I think if I was to draw a, um, a really important lesson here for uh, kind of aspiring entrepreneurs is really kind of the, the, the co-founder that you choose is so, so uh, important. I think the fact you get on with them is definitely not good enough. There should be like kind of strong technical or rather strong synergy. Alexander is very good at like kind of blue sky thinking, business development, and I'm quite like pragmatic technologist. Uh, then we have Catherine Brown uh, and Anthony Hedlum, who are two fantastic advisors. And then a broader team of around 20 engineers, scientists, and developers, extremely multidisciplinary, which is kind of what I find extremely exciting about this product. So in a very kind of reductionist uh, way, uh, what is it that we do? So we create a physics uh, driven um, uh, optimization software for multifunctional additive manufacturing. I know that's quite a term, uh, but hopefully uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll see in the next slide what I mean. But the, really the kind of the core ingredients is we take code, physics and materials, we combine them and then you have additive flow. Okay, so what do we mean by multifunctional? Um, so far, when we design component, we just look at like the external shape, um, where 3D printing kind of really enables a much more granular approach of uh, designing components. So in this case, if you look at nature, um, we can see that it allocates both um, the, the internal composition of the material. So in this case, you have trabecular bone, which is very good at water retention and shock absorbance. And then you have cortico bone, which is really the kind of like um, uh, the material that takes the load. You can see that those are also kind of laid out very um, uh, smartly, I would say. And the result of that, of course, is something that's like uh, the same strength of steel, but 12 times lighter, which like speaking in mechanical engineering terms, that's really something you want to try and achieve, right? Uh, and so just to give you kind of an idea of the complexity that underlies all this, here we have 750 million uh, voxels. So if, if you were to kind of do the manual allocation of those, it would take you a very long time. Uh, our software does it in like uh, yeah, a minute in this case. Okay, so what does this all mean, like practically speaking? Um, well, we have some very exciting uh, applications starting on the left. Uh, we have a collaboration going with a maxillofacial surgeon. Um, so when you have, when you unfortunately kind of break your draw, uh, the, you take a CT scan, you can input that data into our software and it will automatically generate uh, the, the plate based on your specific requirements. Uh, in the middle, we have kind of like a very uh, emerging field um, for um, electric vehicles. So there we're working with some clients on how we can help with multi-physics optimization. Obviously the key to EVs is uh, thermal management. And so by allocating the right material in the right place, uh, we can provide significant improvement to the industry. And on the right, we have uh, a bridge that we did in partnership with uh, DSM, Roland Haskinning, um, Ultimaker and Extreme, which are all kind of global engineering leaders uh, with some fantastic results. Okay, so I prepared a very quick uh, demo here for you just to kind of give you an idea of um, what our software does. So here, um, starting the optimization, you typically, the engineer wants to make this uh, as lightweight uh, and as strong as possible, but also as thermally uh, efficient. So if I go through the process here, we have uploaded our design space, as we call it, and then we define the kind of physical loads. So here in the red arrows, you can see the forces that are gonna be experienced during flight. So these are mechanical forces. 
And then you also have thermal forces uh, or thermal loads rather, which is the heat that comes off the, uh, the, the, the motherboard. Uh, then we define the problems using quite an innovative uh, way, which is via a graph, which you can see here. So it's really important to understand, uh, like before we put this product together, the, the, the way to achieve this would be thousands of very complex lines of code. Whereas here you have a kind of like very intuitive user interface, which really kind of allows anyone to put these things together. And then the output of that is a multi-material optimized uh, chassis for your drone. So here you can see some quite complex shapes. And what the software has done is it's allocated a very strong material, uh, namely the, the gray one in areas of high stress and the thermally conductive one in uh, the blue uh, regions, which is where you need the thermal conductivity. And so then before we take this to manufacture, we can also go um, a step further and generate these kind of very complex uh, internal shapes, which are of course very good for 3D printing. Um, so from here on, we would export it directly. We have like a number of machine integrations to make it pretty seamless. So back to the presentation, I just want to conclude by giving you some ideas of how machine learning is applicable. Um, some of you, I know I have a technical audience here, so um, you might know that partial differential equations are, is the type of mathematics that is used to kind of model the real world. Uh, they're typically very expensive to compute. Um, so using a surrogate model can provide some really drastic improvements. So here we go from three simulation a minute to 6,000 simulation per minute. Uh, in engineering term, this is like, this is huge. Another way um, is um, to actually define the problem. So in this case, we have the engineer typing in the computer, I'd like to optimize my component to sustain the forces whilst being as lightweight as possible. And so this, from this, we can generate the optimization strategy and then optimize the component accordingly. And this is not just some like fluffy concept. The graph that you have seen in my demo is pretty, pretty like simply represented as a JSON. Um, so with all the kind of like uh, NLP to, to code that we have uh, emerging, this kind of thing is very feasible. So thank you so much. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. That was awesome. Thanks, Charles. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Charles right now, um, because I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, I, I've seen you present many times, so I've already asked you in private, but um, I'm sure maybe some people do. But um, if we don't, then um, we can we can proceed. Um, but thank you so much. That was an awesome demo and explanation. Um, Anna, I don't know if Pleasure. you want to, uh, take the take the wheel. Yeah, sure. Um, let me figure out screen sharing on multiple screens. I, it's hard to so seamless. I've got a lot of big act to follow. Um, let me find, hopefully. Hopefully you've got my screen now. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So um, hi everyone, uh, and thanks very much for having me today. Um, so my name's Anna. I am the co-founder and head of operations at Alkira Technology. Um, so I've kind of taken the same brief around, around how we can present ourselves today to, to the guys on the call. Um, I've taken it from a slightly different angle than, than Charles has, but bear with me, hopefully it'll be useful and interesting um, and yeah, very happy to answer questions either on the panel or um, afterwards. Um, so I, um, I wasn't quite like Charles, I didn't, I didn't have my first 3D printer when I was 15 years old. I, um, I was very much curious around physics and uh, actually architecture um, growing up, but got a bit lost on the way, rubbish at art, so I ended up going down the pure science and physics route. Um, so my background is actually in physics. Uh, I did my undergrad at Imperial uh, doing a master's, integrated master's with a year in Europe, uh, and then went back to the same lab I was based in in that year abroad to work on a PhD in graphene physics, uh, specifically some material science looking at the integer and fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, so I moved out to France again to go and to go and um, work on that PhD and pretty quickly realized that I didn't think long term academia was going to be for me. Um, specifically, I think I struggled with I struggled with um, the kind of abstraction that I'd got to by going so deep down the science route that there was not really much real world implications of what I was doing. I think that might be a headache of not doing engineering instead of physics also, but um, but I found that I I found it a struggle to try and pursue going down this route. Um, I lost motivation, I think, in the, in, in the middle. 
um, and decided after after about a year and a half that I wasn't going to continue to pursue the PhD, but try and find something that would take the skills and kind of data capabilities that I'd learned um, during that time period at the same time as having heard a lot in the news around all these AI and ML that has kind of started coming up at the time. So I wanted to find something that would let me pursue my technical curiosity um, as much of the technical skills that I'd managed to gather, but would work in this kind of exciting field that I saw um, emerging. And so um, that's where I kind of ended up with Alkira, which I'll talk about in a second. And this is a very self-congratulatory self slide that I, um, I actually gave to a presentation at my old school and I thought I might as well chuck it in, but this is what the PhD is kind of looking at. I spent a long time in a clean room uh, dressed like I was in Breaking Bad um, using fun acids and the like. So I'm sure some of you on the school in, in your kind of PhD studies and the like are very familiar with the clean room. Um, I couldn't face another two years of using sellotape to stick together and peel apart graphene flakes. So that was kind of part of the contributing factors of me stepping back from the PhD. But I did manage to get um, kind of part of a number of publications. This one probably the shiniest, shiniest of them. Um, but uh, yeah, to you know, hop back. So when I think about um, where then I ended up, uh, I didn't have a specific company idea that I wanted to pursue, but I knew I had an interest in the built environment from growing up and that I had some technical skills in, in data. Um, and I met my co-founder who had already actually started working on Alkira uh, a couple of years prior, um, had incorporated the business, but hadn't yet really started spinning it, spinning its wheels yet. So um, I met my co-founder Emil in 2017. Um, he had already done some kind of preliminary consulting projects with this idea of, of what Alkira Technologies is, which I'll get on to in just a second. Um, and I found him to be a really cool guy. I think Charles, as he said, uh, it's really important to get on with the person that you co-found a company with. Um, and we kind of clicked from the beginning. These days, people say we sound like an old married couple or a divorced couple, depending on the day of the week. But um, it is very important to get on with the person that you're going to be spending a huge amount of time with um, over time. Uh, and so I joined Alkira um, and, and have since kind of ended up being the head of operations and kind of titled co-founder as one of the, the early members of the team, the kind of first three of us who, who set the business up. Um, kind of a quick word to why going down this route makes sense. To me, I've mentioned that kind of the PhD wasn't quite right. And I was looking at my other opportunities based on the fact that I had the kind of like this high technical capability that I'd spent time investing in. I didn't want to go into consulting. I didn't want to go into finance um, in the sectors that kind of most of my peers had. Uh, but why working in a startup and in this environment became really interesting was that um, it let me pursue this technical interest. It let me kind of study uh, or kind of learn new technology as as um, as I was continuing to grow. I call it a bit of a Montessori MBA. So learn by doing. Um, I've had to learn, and actually through the help of the digital catapult and the machine intelligence garage, also learn a lot about um, things that I never studied or knew about, from business development to marketing to investment and getting investors to um, kind of everything in between. Um, Pre-COVID, we traveled a huge amount. Uh, it's a smart city business, so I, I, I've managed to kind of travel the globe uh, a couple of times around in the past five years, uh, which has been amazing. And I, I do enjoy doing that. I miss it and I can't wait to get back um, trying to sell, sell a new smart city solution to Singapore or whatever it may be. Um, on a personal level, I like ticking lists. And so owning the task from end to end was really exciting to me, knowing that we're trying to build something, but we get to create it and we invest in its, in its growth. Um, and the kind of double-edged sword of responsibility that comes with that. So it's amazing to have to have the capability to build something and own it. Uh, you also then are responsible for it and continue to, to for its growth. And um, as someone who comes with little experience and, and a lot of responsibility, when you start to have kind of employees, there's people looking up to you and looking at you for your, their paycheck, it is a lot of responsibility and it can be quite daunting. So having the right network around you has been incredibly important and valuable to, to us and me as we, we've grown as a business. Um, for Digital Catapult, I thought I'd just mention a few a few words around kind of how how we've worked with Digital Catapult on the MI Garage. Um, my first ever meeting with Alkira was actually at the Digital Catapult in King's Cross. So that's a kind of nice place to it. But um, we found it specifically very useful for signposting specific resources on things that we didn't know anything about. Uh, the program support, so um, Francesca mentioned the deep dive, we did an ethics deep dive to help us understand where we needed to kind of be aware and, and take the right boxes for our ethical kind of development of our products. Um, marketing workshops, I've attended one or two of those, just kind of seeing how we want to grow our presence building. Um, we also use some of the NVIDIA compute resource. 
Um, and then again, down there at the bottom there, the presence building and network. So being introduced to investors or um, having good exposure to our customers and to the market and actually leaning on other entrepreneurs like the other guys on this call, just to have, have someone else who's in the same situation as you to bounce ideas off of. Um, so now in the couple of minutes I have remaining, I'll kind of spin through, through what Alkira actually does. I'm sorry to go so far down that route at the beginning. Um, so Alkira um, is a smart city company, as I've mentioned. Uh, we build software tools and machine learning analytics to power what we call data-driven infrastructure. Um, it was established, as I mentioned, uh, back in 2014. Uh, I joined in 2017 when there were still about three of us, uh, based in Cambridge. So I ended up moving here from London, which is a big change. Um, but we build uh, a software platform that we use to help power large scale transport mobility infrastructure. So think airports, roads, uh, the M25, we're doing some stuff there at the moment. Um, specifically, we understand the future of the built environment um, to be kind of changing quite rapidly at the moment, uh, looking at all of these shiny new things like um, connected and autonomous vehicles, uh, thinking about uh, how they're actually going to be deployed out on the roads. And it became apparent that this digital infrastructure that, that doesn't quite exist, but is, is slowly growing around how you connect to the traffic lights or how you kind of can dynamically update um, traffic patterns is, is quite important. Uh, communicating vehicles to infrastructure, um, dynamically pricing a car park. I mean, there's all sorts of things that um, a lot of our customers are wanting to try and do and realizing that they don't have the data capabilities to do so. Um, and so what we do is we built this platform that takes this huge landscape of fragmented, siloed, gappy data um, that is out there and pull it together uh, to make it more usable. So specifically, we take CCTV footage, we take mobile phone data, we take GPS from public transport, uh, and we pull that together into a platform uh, using an event-based driven architecture that um, lets us understand that data in concert. So in the same context, uh, we transform it so that we can understand it. Um, there's a lot of technology that sits behind that with a significant amount of machine learning to help us detect anomalies in the data, look for calibration drift in um, unexpected places, but really making the data consumable as, as a first step. Once we've got that, what then becomes really exciting is that we can start to perform analytics on that data. So we can do network-based models to understand how a car crash on the M25 might affect the M11 or we can um, predict um, we can yeah we, we can predict out gaps in time to look at dynamic maintenance planning for um, the M25. Uh, we do data fusion to help look for gaps in coverage where there may not be sensors um, and effectively perform these kind of different levels of analytics that help a decision maker in a control room or on uh, controlling like a, a bridge, I don't know, be able to have a better a better, set of information to make decisions based off of. Uh, and at the top here, we think about what we call data-driven infrastructure, which is when that infrastructure is really being run as a, as a digital asset. Um, and while this can sound a, a little dry, which, which, which is the main reason why I didn't go into engineering in the first place, um, but you, <laughs> you turn around and look at the, um, the built environment and the transport sector, and it's actually by turnover, the biggest sector in, on the planet, uh, by investment in transport infrastructure. So the actual concrete that's going out on the roads, the service industries that help support that from the modeling all the way up to the operation. Um, and then the digital layers that help now come more and more to, to support what's going on. So um, it's, a, it's a vast market and the software that we build helps the entire lifetime life cycle of that journey. So um, the platform itself looks a bit like this. Uh, and so as I've kind of described, we pull data in from the built environment, either in batches, streams, or um, using kind of multi-access edge computing uh, in the fog, so some 5G fun bits into the platform and make that data available via API or through UIs that we built as applications to the end user. Um, the data ops guys in the back are happy because accessing this data becomes easy, um, sharing it to the right people becomes easy, and the guys at the front end are happy because they're able to actuate on the network in a much more structured way. Uh, be it around dynamically responding to things going wrong uh, all the way up to planning better uh, what might be happening next. And when I mentioned the kind of lifetime of this journey, when you start to have this digital infrastructure in place, you can do things like measure what traffic looks like today or measure um, how people are moving through Heathrow Airport today, implement a change like um, building a third runway at Heathrow or um, shutting down a junction for 24 hours on the M25. 
uh, see what the impact is and plan better for the next time. Um, so we kind of follow that life cycle through and having the software in place has been, it's been very interesting learning just the different ways in which um, taking a more digital approach to how we manage infrastructure can have such an impact. Um, so last slide, I promise. Um, as a full stack, we are, we basically, um, this is a, a kind of nice way to think about us. We have this real-time data backbone. Uh, we have our analytics capabilities uh, where a lot of machine learning takes place, both from the computer vision, um, tracking, tracing, object detection style, um, ML, all the way up to um, the fusion and anomaly detection models, which we use kind of convolutional graph networks and the like um, to then fuel what these uh, later stage applications are that actually have impact on the real world. Um, so we are hiring. Um, we are looking for a software engineer as well as a business development team member at the moment. Uh, and as kind of demonstrated by my background, um, having a technical background and going into the business side of the company is, is can actually be a really valuable and interesting career step. So um, both types of roles open, uh, very interested in speculative applications also. I'd love to come work with you guys. Um, here's my email. And yeah, uh, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you so much, Anna. Awesome as always. And um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the kind of um, your two stories and how they were, they were very different. And um, we've kind of both doing these uh, kick-ass companies. So thanks <laughs> both. Um, Vishal, are you, are you ready to, to take us onto a slightly different application of, of AI? Absolutely. Let me just share my screen. Wonderful. Can you see that? I most certainly can, yes. Great. So uh, my talk's called Cultural Data Scientist to Creative Entrepreneur. Uh, and it's a bit of a chronology of my career path, <clears throat> I guess, uh, which I thought would be quite interesting for people on the call today. So I am, I'm, I'm, in, I'm a number of things. Um, I'm an academic, I am an analyst and consultant and advisor to a range of uh, institutions. Uh, I'm also an entrepreneur. And I really started out life uh, back at the LSE in 2011, same as Frankie. Uh, but uh, I, was, uh, I was studying the economics of cities, but I've always loved art, uh, culture, creativity, design uh, in, in a number of different ways. And straight after my bachelor's, I worked at Sotheby's Auction House, uh, which is a really interesting place to have worked. Um, and I ended up becoming one of the company's uh, first ever data scientists uh, and was moved out to New York to build uh, data visualization products for Sotheby's. I was doing kind of a lot of statistics and analytics to mainly win uh, really, really high value uh, works of art for the auction house compared to their main competitor, Christie's. And that was a ton of fun. Um, but uh, in, my, in my kind of, uh, yeah, whilst I was there, I, I was offered uh, a, a scholarship to do a research degree at the Bartlett at UCL. And so uh, I was doing Sotheby's and the Bartlett uh, simultaneously for about a year. Uh, and then um, I was really loving the work that I was doing at the Bartlett and the research that I was doing and the technical skills that I was learning uh, at the Bartlett um, and ended up um, continuing to do so. Um, the, 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 my main thesis at the Bartlett is uh, I'm still there. Uh, I use data science and visualization to uh, measure the impact of art and culture in cities. So not, you know, not too similar to what Anna was just talking about. And I have a broad set of skills from uh, data science to data visualization and creative coding. Um, and back in 2017, uh, I was doing a lot of this research after I'd left Sotheby's, but I'd always known that I wanted to start some uh, a business of my own. I wasn't quite sure what. Um, and um, yeah, at, at the same time, I was also like, what I was doing was very niche. I was I was applying data science to art and culture in the art market, uh, in the creative industries, which is not something that many people were doing at the time. Uh, and I invented this job title called the cultural data scientist to describe myself. Um, and I wrote a blog post about it, which uh, ended up doing quite well. Um, and yeah, I was kind of referring to myself as this cultural data scientist. Uh, and 
I was doing, uh, in between Sotheby's and my research, I was doing some consultancy work um, for uh, clients like the London Borough of Culture that was managed by the Mayor of London, where I was basically uh, looking at social media data and trying to understand trends in social media data and uh, the impact of certain cultural events. Um, I was also, I did some work for the Barbican and still do some work for them every now and again, uh, trying to uh, apply kind of computer vision and, and uh, different machine learning techniques to understand um, how, the, how people are reacting and, and responded to, to the Barbican's programs. Um, I am doing some work at the moment currently for the European Commission uh, in relation to uh, data visualization. And this is very much kind of, this is very much part-time as a independent uh, consultant. Um, I only do this stuff kind of uh, 30 day a year, uh, very much based off my, um, my, my research as well as my work at Sotheby's. Um, and culminating all of this research together, um, I have been kind of working towards a theory uh, called cultural data science, um, where I published a paper called Defining Cultural Data Science, which uh, technically is like the first definition of, of the field. Um, and it's, it's cultural data science is uh, a mismatch uh, between kind of uh, theories from arts and humanities, social science, computer science, and mathematics all coming together um and yeah it, it's a pretty new thing um but uh yeah i'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of adapting my research as I, as I go through um but all of this is very niche and very unique and i started to do a lot of public speaking about the work that i was doing um traveling the world uh well not necessarily the world but across different cities at least in europe and uh, I managed to build a fair amount of followers on social media on the back of my research and work that I was doing at Sotheby's, over 30,000 followers now, which is, which is quite nice. Um, and so what I found was that I was operating as a content creator uh, around kind of 2018, 2019, uh, where cultural data science, uh, yeah, cultural data science and me as a cultural data scientist was my kind of identity and was the, um, the ideas and knowledge that I was able to translate to people through blog posts and videos and, and stuff like this, um, until I came across a quite severe problem, which is that when I was recording videos to uh, put on YouTube or to share with people, um, I didn't use my smartphone. I ended up using a professional camera like one that I'm using at the moment uh, to, to, as this webcam to create uh, videos, but uh, my camera was, was um, a real pain to operate. I don't know if anyone's used a professional camera recently, but um, th there's a whole host of issues from the memory card to the menus being awful, uh, to them being quite heavy and clunky and not having internet access, no access to an app store or anything like that. You can't upload onto social media. Uh, but people use uh, professional cameras because their quality are much better than smartphones. Yes, even the, the new iPhone 13 Pro. Um, and at the same time, I realized that on the other hand, you had smartphones that were, um, that were, that were kind of facilitating this huge growth of social media data online uh, because of their ease of use, their convenience. Uh, and whilst I was, you know, analyzing a lot of this social media data for my cultural data science research, uh, I noticed that uh, most of the data or most of the videos that are being uploaded onto social media are coming from smartphones, not from professional cameras. Um, and so with these kind of trends in mind, um, uh, I, I, I also identified that there were tens of millions of people around the world, uh, like me or much more sophisticated than me, who were are making a living as, as a content creator, sharing their passions online at scale to their audience uh, on a weekly basis. Um, and so most YouTubers, as you can see in this, in this image, uh, this lady making a, uh, what looks like a loaf of bread or maybe some muffins, I'm not entirely sure, uh, uses uh, a professional, most of these YouTubers who, who make an income use professional cameras to to, to record their, their, their content because of their quality, the point I raised uh, before. And so I wanted, um, 
it kind of came about as a complete coincidence, but I ended up on this entrepreneurship program called Entrepreneur First. Sorry, I'm just going to draw the curtain because the sun is literally beaming in my face. Here we go. Um, I joined this uh, entrepreneurship program called Entrepreneur First, and uh, which is based in London. It's it, the way that I would say it's like a deep tech pre-accelerator. That's the way they kind of brand themselves. Um, and I met my co-founder, Liam, who is a PhD electrical engineer, who's very interested in hardware, very interested in kind of embedded systems, uh, but also uh, was interested in photography. Uh, and both of us had kind of similar gripes about cameras uh, in terms of their lack of innovation and usability. And so we came up with the genesis of this idea uh, of, of the Alice camera on Entrepreneur First, uh, which is our vision was to really build a camera that had the experience that you would expect from a smartphone, but the quality that you'd expect from a DSLR. Uh, and we wanted to empower this new generation of content creators uh, with a camera that was more suited to a fast paced content lifestyle. And uh, we developed our first prototype, which uh, is this uh, green looking uh, device right at the front where you can see the lens attached to the back of a, a smartphone. Uh, and we presented it in 2019 at the Beyond Conference that was run by UKRI and the Creative Industries Council. Uh, it, was, it was a serious kind of Frankenstein uh, creature at, at the time, but um, it's definitely got much nicer uh, over time, which I'll show you. But we developed this first prototype of the Alice camera. Uh, the name Alice comes from uh, it being an AI accelerated computational camera, which is a bit of a mouthful. So we called Alice. Um, and then over time, uh, Alice has kind of evolved and developed in a number of different ways. Uh, we won an innovation grant from Innovate UK, and we expanded from a team of uh, two to a team of three. My brother joined the team and then to a team of six um, to, to really go out and commercialize Alice. And the Digital Catapult played a huge role in that journey. Um, we took part in two programs run by the Digital Catapult. Firstly, the, the Machine Intelligence Garage, then the 5G testbed accelerator. Um, here you can see us doing a demo uh, of, of, a, of, of a live stream from the Alice camera. But the Digital Catapult gave us access to uh, a lot of cloud compute credits, but also uh, connections. We found our contract manufacturer through the Digital Catapult. Uh, we bumped into Charles and the Additive Flow team at the Digital Catapult. Uh, we bumped into uh, Indiegogo, which is uh, a sales platform uh, for kind of early stage hardware products at the Digital Catapult. Uh, and over time, the team have been excellent in terms of uh, connecting us to investors, but also providing technical advice. Uh, I'm thinking of people like Hugo and Nathan on the Digital Catapult, uh, as well as uh, many others that, that, that have helped us over time. Um, Okay, so to dive a bit deeper into the technology, um, Alice is a professional uh, optical device that, that um, has a professional micro four thirds sensor uh, with a professional lens mount where you can attach different lenses to it. But what differentiates Alice to other cameras is that inside it has uh, a dedicated AI chip, uh, the Google Edge TPU, uh, as well as a Qualcomm uh, chip and this kind of novel hardware this hardware architecture is novel in the camera industry uh, because what you find in the the reason smartphones have got so much better over time is because they make uh, use of neural processing units inside of their devices whereas traditional cameras don't actually have such sophisticated uh, hardware architectures now by stuffing alice with these uh, novel chips we're able to run neural network calculations on device in real time, uh, which traditional cameras are not able to do. Uh, oops, I did not mean to, sorry, let me do that. There we go. Um, so, so we're able to run this interesting computational photography on, on the camera uh, and DSLR quality content because of its professional optical system. However, the controls of the camera are all done through your smartphone. It attaches to the back of your smartphone. Uh, and our aim with the app is to give creators maximum control uh, in terms of being able to shoot and edit uh, content from their phone. 
So uh, all the controls are done for your smartphone screen, but all the content is uh, can be distributed and shared and airdropped uh, and live streamed from your phone using uh, the five G connection of your phone if you if you have five uh, G. Uh, but if not, you know it's uh, you can still control Alice uh, using your phone. Um, and this is just a slide on our AI pipeline, which essentially uh, makes it much easier for the creator to um, uh, use or, or, or gain access to uh, color enhancement and super resolution and denoising algorithms on device in real time. Actually, uh, there are a lot of B2B applications uh, of this technology, especially for smart city applications as well. Um, but our, our focus is very much on uh, content creators. Um, here we go. Now we've, um, we did our first pre-order campaign earlier this year, uh, which we collected pre-orders from 300 backers. Um, and uh, we raised revenues of 175,000 pounds. We're now gearing up for our second campaign on Kickstarter later this uh, October, aiming to sell double that amount. Uh, we now have a team of over 10 people. There are only six people listed here, but 10 people in total, um, a mixture of data scientists, hardware engineers, um, people from finance, uh, computer vision and computational photography engineers, uh, and people in marketing and content. I recently spoke with Professor uh, Dr. Hannah Fry uh, and Susie Ruffle, a comedian, uh, on a podcast organized by Samsung about the future of content, uh, which uh, I think uh, I think five G and augmented reality play a really important role in the future of content, and we'd love to be able to tap into mixed reality with Alice. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Um, sorry, I don't know why I keep doing that. Uh, yeah, and that's a wrap really. Uh, lastly, I, I do try my best uh, to write as much as I can about uh, not just my academic research, but also some of the work that I'm doing as an entrepreneur. So if you want to uh, stay in touch, you can find me on Substack. Um, please consider subscribing. But otherwise, thank you for listening. Um, as I've been talking, I noticed that my camera uh, ran out of battery so <laughs> maybe you won't be able to see my face anymore but i'm going to stop sharing thank you so much that was awesome and thanks for um yeah the story and and how alice cameron came to be and also the 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 cultural data scientist um that, that's that's really cool i hope we can learn more about that um shortly um i think i guess that leaves renee um so welcome and um please over to you Thank you so much, Francesca. Let me just go ahead and share my screen. If everybody can see. I can see perfectly, thank you. Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you for uh, listening in to my story, A Journey to Inclusive Growth. I am CEO and co-founder of Sitzmas, Randy Perkins, and my background is slightly different from what, what, my, what I'm currently doing at the moment. I, orig I am originally from China and came over to study um, the first degree, second degree, and then stayed behind, met a man, got married, have two kids. <laughs> so there we are. Um, I started my professional career with Ernst & Young in their banking capital market segment. Um, so really looking to the consultancy side of things, the uh, financial service valuations, then moving to, uh, then moved to uh, HSBC investment banking arms and valuing equities, equity derivatives and fixed incomes in emerging markets. Now you, you wonder why is, a, why is a, a Chinese girl from China came over to study and stayed here um, and worked in a slightly different fields, starting his, uh, his, his uh, technology startup called CityMass with a focus on, with a mission to make the world accessible for everyone. The story actually starts with um, me and my co-founder, AKA my husband, um, been founded a couple of other venture before all focus on sustainable transportations and it was actually a story that's where we went back to china for our our wedding um, in china back in 2012 uh, where we saw there's a huge amount of phenomena in terms of electric scooters electric mopeds and and that has 
fundamentally transform a lot of um, pollution figures within China just because the sheer size of the people actually using electric scooters compared to previously uh, uh, motorcycles. So that's inspired us to set up our EJ electric scooter, which is a micro EV network that we were working with the Green Energy Fund. And, um, and, and with the vision to really combat the congestions and emissions in the city. Um, unfortunately, that, that story got hit when the funding run shots where Brexit came in, where the Green Energy Fund was actually a European fund. So that's a real life, uh, real life impact on the on, on the on Brexit on, on, on startups and, and uh, in the UK back then, we can clearly feel. And, as we were just working on these ventures, and we also, we, we as we working on these ventures, and um, with more research on um, some of the personal problems that we were facing as a family, I'd like you to meet Louis. Louis here is a uh, wheelchair user. You can see, and he was he's actually fostered by my mother-in-law. As a family, we quite often find it very difficult to find access venue to celebrate joyous locations like anniversaries and birthdays because the lack of information, accessibility information, because the lack of the difficult communication channels. And, um, and that is something that we, by doing research, found out there were 14 million people, other million other million people other in the UK facing exactly the same problem, lack of accessibility information. And when I was, uh, when I was pregnant with my, when I was uh, um, with, with my young daughter, it was with a pram traveling through London on the ground, so we might uh, two year old back then, I also find exactly the same problem. I couldn't find out where the stations is accessible, where I normally travel to London with no problem. All of a sudden, with my push pumps and the baby and a little young one so that try to grapple the corner of my clothes and, and travel to London, it was stressful. It was similar pain points and problems I was facing. Then all of a sudden, the problem Louis was facing has extended to be more than just 14 million people in, in, in the UK alone, and that's 1 billion in the world, to actually situational disabled. I call myself situational disabled just because I couldn't move as freely as before, because I have to have considerations of the prompts, whether I can, whether the lift of the stations is operable when I was, when I'm traveling in London, and whether I can actually you know, ask people to help me to go across the bridge, to go to the uh, platform two from platform one to, to get my connection will be stressful. So now that's the statistics I was talking about, actually one in five people in the world are disabled and that's according to United Nations, one billion. And a lot of, many people may not be familiar with these statistics, but it's shocking given aging populations and, you know, hidden disabilities and more, more and more people I've spoken about um, disabilities that, was the beginning journey of City Mass, where we set out to solve that particular problem that I described, faced by Louis and myself. Uh, as I mentioned, that's you know, there's a lot of um, uh, our words currently designed for the able bodies. A lot of obstacles that we're currently facing, not just a physical world now, but also in the digital world because of pandemic. Every single business is moving online. Digital transformation is 10x faster and bigger across different sectors and, and segments. So that's when we were thinking using technologies to make a digital and physical world accessible for everyone. And in the meantime, we are helping businesses and organizations to grow by that 20% of the populations by just doing the right thing that includes your products and offering and your services for everybody. So that that was the opportunities that we sold and that four, one, 14 million in the UK, and 1 billion in the world. And 70% of people with disabilities actually require some sort of tool to access online products and services, such as just consume contents and website, for example. And now they have a spending power according to departments of work and pension is 274 billion pounds. In, in the world, it's $8 trillion. And that represents the, um, the annual disabled household spending power. And that's a lot of spending power businesses, organizations are not currently tapping into at the moment. That's why City Mass exists. Now, 
this is some statistics that's been done very well research organizations, including Purple Space. And click away pound is real, it's here, it's now. What that means is 86% of people are willing to pay more to shop for more accessible sites. And 83 will limit their shopping to only accessible sites. 70% will abandon their cart if they're not accessible online. And on average in the UK, business is losing on two billion pounds a month if they're not accessible for everybody. And that's no brainer to make, you know, to make every, every online businesses to be accessible because they were twice likely to have a lot high, higher revenue because they get access to a new ocean, <laughs> a new market segments they, they're not able to tap into. And they're three times likely to be more economic, to bring more uh, economic profits. What that means is that, you know, they will improve their brand awareness, reputation, and uh, increase their uh, retentions on talents and attract new talents such as millennials and Gen Zs. So today I'd like to talk about a couple of studies uh, with City Smart products uh, about digital inclusions, especially in the post-COVID world where I explain how transformations has been digital, has been at a scale, and also how our mobility map can, can in, enable inclusive living. So who is City Mass? City Mass's uh, journey has been an incredible one for me personally, because as you know, um, somebody that had not started this before, we had help from various different incubators and accelerators. Digital Catapult has been a fantastic uh, uh, incubator for us and for exactly the same reasons Michelle was explaining, together with a lot of, lot of accelerators out there now, that um, a new startup entrepreneurs and, and, and uh, innovators can actually really tap into incredible resources. So a lot of times, you know, if you make yourself known you, what the problem that you're trying to solve, they will come to you, actually. There's a lot of competitions, I would say, in the accelerators and incubator space. Um, as long as you know, as long as you make yourself known in terms of the problem you're, so, you're solving. And we'll continue working with charities and to, to co-research, co-develop and co-testing our products and services. Um, you know, we have won a number of awards from from um, the Department of Transport, European Commissions as well, uh, European, uh, European Startup Prize, um, and we're working with a, a number of big commercial partners, including Microsoft, PwC's, and Atos, Avis Project Group. So what we've created, we created a microservice architecture level of, um, of products and services. One is the SysMe, providing a personalized user experience for any individuals who actually visits a website. And we have a where which is engine automatically scanned any websites against an international standard called web content accessibility guidelines. We have mobility map, which is a global platform providing the accessibility data um, to solve the problem I was describing with Louis, finding access, accessible venue to celebrate occasions. Um, what does it look like? I mean, I'm more than happy to share this if anybody's interested, but I'll just quickly go through what it looks like to assist me, where you can with single line of code into any website. You can turn on a visual profile, you can change the way that it looks, bigger text, sizes, different alignments. For people with dyslexia, they can change the letter and work spacing so that it works better in terms of consuming that content for them. You can change the content adjustment, you can change the style adjustments as well, i.e. the color contrast, dark mode, light modes, and also the color of text as well, in case you're colorblind, um, or you simply just prefer reading, uh, you know, purple text for your eyes. And you can change your navigation adjustments as well, where you can turn on screen reader for visual impair, you can still consume the information because it will read out loud the text for visual impaired. Um, for the elderly, they have reading guides, highlighting text for people with newer, newer uh, diverse conditions, and um, and bigger cursors for them to be able to navigate easier um, based on their needs and their preferences. So for people with diff different disabilities, it makes access to any online presence possible. But for other people, it makes it very uh, personalized experience. Hence, will increase your engagement rates for websites. One of our clients actually see 230% increase in their, in their visitors and engagement increased by 2,000%. So 
So aware, anybody can actually go on this website now, www.citymaster.io forward slash aware to check whether the online website is accessible, whether it's any breaches against this international standard called web content accessibility guidelines. And that guidelines actually is conform with laws and regulation across 48 countries, uh, in UK included. And um, there is a web accessibility regulation came into play 2000. Um, September will require all the public sector in the UK and EU to be compliant with this WCAG 2.1 AA standard. And, and our, our tech will be able to help you um, to, to, to find out any breaches. Um, we're also offering consultancies as well to help correcting any breaches against these guidelines. So Mobility Map, Mobility Map is our global platform. It's completely free for users to use. Um, and you can type any restaurant name or, or postcodes or any places in the world that you'd like to find out and it will give you the accessible place or it will give you accessibility information of the place, whether it's accessible, partially accessible or not accessible. From my spontaneous travel perspective, on the right-hand side here, you can see it provides a real-time accessibility information, such as in Houston, Houston Square here, step-free access has been restored at the station, uh, but in Bond Street, this entrance exits remain closed by when. And those are, those are informations are vital for um, people with disabilities and wheelchair users as well to achieve that spontaneous travel. But uh, our platform enables the end user rich feedbacks as well to help the entire community to avoid the same travel anxiety. For example, the normal station for them to travel is accessible and it has a lift, but at the time of their travel, it's not anymore. That kind of information, dynamic information will help to have more seamless travel experience. And business communities or, or organization can sign up to our platform and providing answer short service accessibility, and then they can um, make their services and their venue known to the disabled communities. We actually use the machine learning uh, when things have got to predict any missing data points um, on our platform with accuracy of 80%. With the latest um, experiments with uh, Alan Turing Institute, we have reached uh, to 90%, which is fantastic, which is uh, one of the projects that uh, that form Digital Cat were introducing to us to, uh, to Alan Turing Institute. So thank you for that. Uh, so the, the data-driven approach is obviously a, a, a going mainstream, and um, our our service of data streaming services can be consumed by various different sectors, including the property aggregator. In fact, this is an inspiration from a, a wheelchair user um, who is a lawyer recently um, got a job in London, and she was trying to find a accessible flat to rent. But by the time she finished doing her due diligence research, the nearby amenities and whether the local supermarkets are accessible around the property, the property is gone. So the property in London moving so fast that and the lack of that kind of information uh, for her to make an informed decision has made her suffer from not being able to accept the job. This is an incredible real life uh, examples of a pain point that we're trying to solve. And when we dig in deep to deeper, actually, by a research by LSE, London School of Economy, that there is one million hidden housing market out there that, um, you know, accessible housing are required, but the um, the demand is not met by the supply at the moment. So, mobility map data, accessibility data can also help not only help the property aggregators, but also help hotels to 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 service their their customers better and um, other organisations such as supermarkets and and corporates to help their disabled employees to um, to feel inclusive in the organisation. So I think I'm just going to wrap up with your co uh, with a quote: uh, "Technology is not a privilege; it is just a, just a tool to succeed. So let's make it inclusive." Thank you for listening, and uh, you know, feel free to get connected. This is my contact details, and um, yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Renee. It's crazy that when you kind of like say all those stories about um, just how much. Um, people are limited by technology not being inclusive you think like how is this not 
on every single website already. Um, so, so that was fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I think unless we've got any kind of immediate questions from the participants, which it seems that we does that, that we don't, um, that maybe we can uh, move on to the to the panel discussion. Um, Sharon, I don't know if you have if there are any other elements that we needed to cover. If not, I will. No, please feel free to move on. I think all those presentations were fantastic and really insightful and, and exciting. So thank you so much for sharing your journeys. I can't wait to hear what you discuss um, next. Thank you.